Welcome to the Rich, Young, and Powerful Podcast. This is the place where we help average givers become everyday philanthropists. I'm your host, Andrew McNair, a financial commentator, author, nine-figure wealth manager, and philanthropist too. I'm going to show you how to give more, how to find more fulfillment, and help you impact the causes that you care about the most. Because when a giver gives more, they receive and become more. And I feel so honored to bring on our next guest today on the show. And our topic today is going to be giving in light of eternity. And I thought, what a better person to speak on this topic than the person that literally wrote the book on heaven, uh, in addition to the Bible, of course. And he is a New York Times bestselling author. He's wrote The Treasure Principle. He's wrote over 40 books. Last time I counted, uh, I mean, really, if you think about it, 40 books, most average people have not read one, two, three books books after high school. So he's wrote more books than most people sadly read. So Randy, welcome to the show. Thanks. Great to be with you, Andrew. Well, I want to jump right into it and ask you, how does living with an eternal perspective change the way that we live? Well, it transforms everything because uh, if you're storing up for yourselves treasures on earth, which is exactly what you'll be doing and nothing else if you don't have an eternal perspective. Then as you get older and you may keep accumulating things, but every day of your life, you're getting closer to the day that you're going to part from your treasures. If your treasures are on earth, uh, you're getting closer to leaving them behind every day, or they may leave you behind. It can go either way. But one one thing for sure, you're not going to have an eternal relationship with your earthly treasures. But when you turn it around, like Jesus says to do, and store it for yourselves treasures in heaven, living with that eternal perspective, then everything changes. Because now every day of your life, instead of heading away from your treasures, you're headed toward your treasures. And the person who's headed away from his treasures has reason to despair. And the person who's headed toward his treasures has reason to rejoice. So you live a happier life when you have an eternal perspective. And that's so important. And I would love for you to speak to that retiree, maybe that's listening and speak to the the same retiree that I speak to every day, because many times we've stored up, we've been frugal, we've been very shrewd with our money, we've accumulated a retirement nest egg. And when I sit down with families, we're talking about how do we spend this money and how do we enjoy this money? But I also want to always tell them that, you know, this retirement, maybe 10, 20, 30 years, it's above our pay grade, how long it will be. But we have to keep that eternal perspective, even with retirement. We just don't want to, you know, just spend, spend, spend. We actually want to start thinking, how do we start actually sending money ahead of ourselves? And so what would you say to the retiree that's about to retire, has this new chapter of life and to really give them that eternal perspective as they go in to this retirement chapter of life? I would say, look for every opportunity you have to give. And that includes giving not only of your money, but of your time, um, your talent, uh, everything that God has entrusted to you, which all belongs to him anyway. Uh, Every breath that we take comes from God. Uh, but invest it in other people and in things that will last forever, which includes other people, uh, includes God's word. It includes um, the, the difference of sharing the gospel with people, uh, helping people who are poor and needy. These are things that will count for eternity. God promises eternal reward. And that's it's, just, it's such an important subject. Uh, one of my books is called The Law of Rewards. And it's amazing how often scripture promises us rewards and obviously wants us to you know, be motivated by rewards. And to us, it sounds like, oh no, that's terrible. That's a horrible motivation. I, I've had people say to me, you should, the only thing that ever should motivate you is love. Love for God and love for people. Well, that's actually one of three things that should motivate us in Scripture. Now, I would say it's the most important of them, but there's that. And then there's also the fear of consequences if we don't do what God calls us to do. And by consequences, of course, I'm not talking about purgatory for a believer or something like that. Scripture doesn't teach that. 
But it does teach that we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account for all that we have done in the body. And then it says whether good or bad. And at first it's like, oh, no, you, you got to be kidding me. I mean, you know, we're not going to be held accountable for evil we've done. Well, of course we're forgiven in Jesus. But I think the whole point of it is you got to live your life still as a believer, not thinking, oh, well, the only thing that matters is that I'm saved. First Corinthians 3 makes very clear, no, it matters that we live a life honoring to the Lord that he wants to reward us for. So whether you're going into retirement or you're doing anything else, I would say keep in mind eternity and making an eternal difference. Yeah, that's so important. I mean, for that retiree entering that chapter of life, I mean, now they have more time, they have more freedom, and that's such a, a great opportunity for them to have more gospel conversations. And I think it's so much more opportunity to go volunteer and do more mission trips. And because so many times we have these work uh, requirements that we have to feed a family, we have to raise, you know, three or four children, take care of them. But, you know, when we get to this, you know, really clean slate in retirement, we have such a great opportunity. And I believe we should be living in light of eternity for the 30 years preparing for retirement, of course. But now you have this clean slate. We really have no excuse not to be living uh, full out for Christ with our time, with our resources. And I, I think it's so important to live in light of eternity. And for those who are still saving for retirement, uh, I think you should definitely be not worrying about some reputation, you know, at the workforce, if you say, oh, I need to just put in extra hours, that's not going to last uh, in the light of eternity. If I spend an extra few hours at work, no, what I do for the kingdom is going to matter. So keeping those priorities. But I love what you said about, um, you know, what dry, what motivates us is definitely one thing is love. And you said fear. I mean, I'm in Proverbs right now in my own quiet time and fear the Lord is mentioned so many times uh, in Proverbs and Psalms. And I think it's for obvious reasons. That's how you get wisdom is you, you fear the Lord. And because you understand that's how he invented the laws of the universe. And if we go against his will and against those laws, we're, we're asking for trouble. Exactly. And I think that's where, um, yes, motivated by love uh, and yes, motivated by the hope and the promise uh, of eternal reward. And by the way, I speak a lot about heaven and eternity and the word hope in the Bible, uh, I almost wish we, translations would use a different word, um, promise, expectation, whatever, because to us, hoping is like, well, I hope one day, like when you're young, that I'll be a quarterback in the NFL. I hope one day I'll become president. I hope one day that I'll be the wealthiest person in the world. Or, you know, whatever people hope for, it's wishful thinking often. So hope is a pretty vague, ethereal word that doesn't locked down to reality sometimes. Uh, but in scripture, hope is the blood-bought hope, the blood-bought promise of Jesus. And so like when we, well, I hope someday after, and I hear people say this, I hope someday when I die that I go to heaven. So, well, you should really know that. And it should not be dependent upon, in your mind, anything that you do but on the grace mm. of Jesus. So same thing mm. is true, you know, though it's somewhat different, but in, in the area of eternal rewards, it's not just the hope of reward in a vague sense, but in the blood-bought promise of Jesus. So you And you've got the fear of consequence. So you've got love for other people, you've got the hope of reward, you've got the fear of consequences. And fear of consequences, again, doesn't mean eternal punishment for the believer. It means loss of reward. And it talks about that in 1 Corinthians 3. And Loss of reward is a real and true loss. I mean, the Apostle Paul would not call it loss if it is not loss. So it don't exactly. mean that we will spend eternity regretting everything. You know, I don't think that's what heaven is like. But I do mean we have a unique opportunity right now to share the gospel, to feed the poor, to help people caught in sin, uh, to live a life of purity uh, before the Lord. This is our opportunity to do that here and now. 
Yeah, I think, you know, living in light of eternity and understanding that even as a believer, we're going to have to give an account is so important. And if we're not, if we're biblically illiterate, sometimes we think, well, only giving an account is for the unbeliever. And it's like, no, we need to live in light of eternity because we're going to have to give an account. And so I think that's so important. And, and I, mentioned, I mentioned just ago about laws that we have uh, that God's created that, that run the universe that he's created and shared with some of these laws and principles in the Bible with us. And I want to talk about one of those principles, and that is the treasure principle, which you have uh, your famous book titled after. What is the treasure principle? Yeah, when I was first writing that book, I thought, what is a way to kind of capture the essence of this? Like sometimes uh, if if somebody's preaching, uh, this is the main idea. Well, the treasure principle to me uh, is, and this is how I define it in the book, it's you can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. And we know you can't take it with you. And there's a number of passages in the Bible that essentially you would summarize by saying in Ecclesiastes and other places, you can't take it with you. But Jesus adds a corollary to that in a remarkable way in Matthew chapter 6 and in the context in verses 19 through 21, in the context he's already uh, been talking about giving at the beginning of chapter 6, uh, giving and fasting and praying and don't do it uh, to receive the approval of others, uh, but do it to receive the approval of God because he's the audience of one, right? So now he comes back to it. Don't start for yourselves treasures on earth. And those treasures, uh, treasure meant something of material financial value. Uh, so whether it's cash or, or, or jewels or, uh, you know, gold or possessions or whatever it is, it's material wealth. So don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth and then, and then listen to the logic. Where moth and dust corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. Okay, so he's not saying don't do it because it's wrong. Of course, it is wrong in in the sense that if he tells us not to do it, it's wrong to do it. But what he's saying is don't do it because it's stupid. It's not going to last. Instead, he says, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And so right when you think, oh, he's against storing up treasures, and he's certainly against storing up treasures for yourself, no, he's not at all. He's now commanding us, store up. And for who? For yourselves, Treasures in heaven. The self-interest part of this is pretty remarkable because we always think of the gospel being the call to sacrifice. And indeed it is. Take up your cross daily. Follow me. And then we have a passage saying, do it because it's best for you. Now, of course, we don't put that first. We do it because it honors God. And so it's best for him and his glory. We do it secondly because the, the second command. There's love the Lord your God with all your heart. And then there's love your neighbor as yourself. So we do it out of love for others. But in addition to being in God's best interest, his glory, and in the best interest of others, because we're helping them and being perhaps a good example to them as well. But then it's in our best interest, not simply in this life, though there's nothing like the joy of giving. So I think there is a huge payoff uh, for giving in this life. But the emphasis in that passage is eternity. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where, you know, moths and rust do not corrupt, where thieves do not break, break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And by the way, if you want to get your heart into the kingdom of God more than you ever have, there's the formula. Give to the kingdom of God like you never have. And this is not just, you know, something that Jesus actually preached. He actually had one-on-one -on -one conversations. And this is why I named the show Rich, Young, and Powerful is when the rich young ruler came to him, he says, hey, you're going to, I want you to give everything you have to the poor. And it's not so that he just lost all of his, his riches, that he was trading his riches, his earthly riches for eternal riches. And and that's where the, the treasure principle comes uh, into play is, is store up your things 
things that are going to last that are heavenly. And that is spreading the gospel, doing the will of the Lord. And so I think this is at play in multiple parts in scripture. So I love the treasure principle, but I've witnessed this, uh, Randy personally, you know, with my investment company, you know, advising families and about the moth and the rust. I've seen people have their fortune stolen in multiple ways from white collar, uh, situations where they have invested with someone that was unscrupulous to someone that literally just stole money from them. I've seen people that stored up tons of newspaper articles and stored up all of these belongings and attics. And then when the kids have to, you know, actually sell that home and do the estate sell, what was treasure to them became on the front lawn sold for pennies on the dollar of what they paid right. for it. And so trying to give, you know, families the reality check that no, all the stuff that you're accumulating is not treasure. Moth will start attacking at it. And we have to start living in light of eternity with our finances, with our resources. Yeah, I talked with a friend yesterday who, um, pretty close to his family historically, knew his parents well, um, and uh, his uh, mom died several years ago, and his dad died just very recently. Mm. All right, so now now what happens? Now the kids who all have their own uh, 401k or retirement funds and this, that, and the other thing – are inheriting their parents' 401, okay, retirement. I mean, in, in other words, and, and then the value of their house and, and the value of a middle-class house uh, is shocking. I mean, mm-hmm. so many people have this story, but, um, you know, in the late 70s, we bought our house uh, with a, a good, pretty good chunk of land, uh, Still, still live here. Uh, and we bought it for forty nine thousand dollars. And of course, I don't want the uh, government to uh, value it as high as they do <laughs> uh, because of the taxes that I have to pay. But sure. it's like okay. And so the last thing I look at it, it's it's six hundred forty nine thousand or something like that. Okay, so it's it's multiplied. I mean, again and again, it is multiplied, uh, however many times, and then that's, it is not a, a mansion. It is not what people go, man, I wish I lived in that house. That's just a house. But right. the value is incredible. And there are so many middle-class families who, when you take uh, the, the physical assets that they have and the uh, financial um, programs, investments, and all of that kind of stuff that they have, and various other things, and you add it all together, a middle class family can leave millions of dollars behind. And Certainly. if you if you would have said that 20, 30 years ago, you'd go, oh no, I mean, middle class families don't leave behind millions of dollars. Well, now they do, often. And now now the crazy thing is this. So then somebody asks the question. Uh, so uh, I, I know I should tithe on this. Should, should I do it? Uh, should I wait until we receive the, the money uh, and, you know, take it out of the funds or whatever? Well, I, I would just say that that question is is one thing. But when you say, I think we should tithe on this, it's like, really? Is that all? So you're telling me you already have uh, more stored up. You're already in the 99th percentile of the world's wealthy. And Almost every middle class person in America is. If they're not, they're in the 98th percent uh, of the world's wealthy. But 99 percent. That means that you can be in the same uh, percentage point of wealth in the world as Warren Buffett and Bill Gates. Now, they're 99.999 and you're 99.1. But the point is, I mean, that's just shocking you are so, so far better off than the vast majority of people in the world. I know a few years ago, the uh, average person who was making uh, uh, a, what is what is the, the break-off point of uh, uh, the, what do you call it, the, the, the low income? income. Yep. Low yeah, poverty not median line. income, but poverty level. Poverty level, that's what I was going for, okay? And it was, poverty level was 
for a family of four to make $25,000 a year. Then when you compare that to the rest of the world, there used to be a website called globalrichlist.com. Uh, don't go there anymore. Who knows what's there by now? Uh, but uh, it, it's usually bad. Uh, but um, but that was so revealing. And But there are other equivalent websites, but they're not quite as clear. But at that time, the person at that poverty level in, in America that making $25,000 a year for the family of four was in the 98.7% of the world's wealthy. Wow. So this is how shocking this is. So I think for most of us, just come to grips with the fact that you're wealthy. So when First uh, Timothy 6 talks about those who are wealthy, it's not, they're not talking about somebody else. They're talking about you and me. That's, that's right. Us. Rich is always someone else. And that that's what's scary is if we're not careful, we'll always say, you know, rich is someone else when it right. really is us in the mirror. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah, uh, Randy uh, used to share a website and might be still that, that website you just mentioned, but isn't there a website where you can see how wealthy you are stacked up to everyone else? Yes. And that's what globalrichlist.com was. And there's another couple of them now, but I forget their names. But people should like check that out because if you don't believe well, us, they're good. Yes. Yeah. I mean, if you don't believe us, go do the research. You are super right. wealthy. And many times people say, well, you know, I have certain financial circumstances. I have my, this family issue that I have to give towards. We are very wealthy here in the United States and we cannot buy into the lie that someone else is going to give towards the kingdom of God. One, because we'll miss out on the, the giving. Right. It's, it's not that, you know, God's going to miss out. We're going to miss out on the giving. Right. And so that's why it's so important important uh, to get our giving correct in the light of eternity. And so, Randy, I'd love for you to speak to the relationship between focus and finances and how can we get more focused on uh, what the kingdom of God is and what the will of God is with our finances? Yeah, I, I think we go to God's word, we search the scriptures to see what they say, this is how I wrote my first book on finances, uh, a big book called Money, Possessions, and Eternity. And it's, it's still a fantastic a book. That, book. People yeah, should thanks. read it. Uh, that's influencing a lot of people. In fact, the, the four men who started uh, the organization Generous Giving, if you want to learn about giving, mm -hmm. I mean, go to generousgiving.com or .org. Either one will work. And you will find resources. I mean, the number of videos, the number of families at generous giving conferences, many of which I've been at telling their stories and it's exciting and it's wonderful. And in my book, uh, giving is the good life. I, I have a hundred stories that are in that book. Now they're short. There may be a couple of paragraphs each, but they're just giving the, the taste of what you, you can do. But I'm telling you, uh, th those guys uh, who had read Money, Possessions, Eternity started Generous Giving, and so much has come out of that ministry. But back when I wrote that book, I, I was, I mean, Ron Blue had a great book on finances, but a lot of it was financial planning and, you know, that sort of thing. And that was fine. And Ron's a good friend. And um, he and I have spoken together a lot. But mm -hmm. what hit me was, I was preparing, I was a pastor at the time, and I was preparing a series of messages. And I said to myself, you know what? I'm going to do a series of messages on money, what the Bible says about money. Uh, it will include giving, but it won't be limited to giving. Uh, so um, I, I wonder, uh, should I do like a four-week series, a six-week series, or would that be like too much? Would I not have enough material? I mean, it was ridiculous. Once I got into it, and kept seeing how much scripture says about wealth. And it's weird. I went to Bible college and seminary and no professor ever remarked on how much the Bible has to say about this. And so we, we, we tend to not put, put it all together, but you know, something like 15% of everything Jesus said related to money and possessions. And then by implication, many other things he said. Every time he talked about sacrifice and kingdom living also relates to money and possession, but I mean directly. And so when scripture says what it does about wealth and the management of wealth, and I think the key thing for me, and I would say to people, and I actually had somebody tell me one time, 
you don't have to keep saying, and you and other people like you <laughs> don't have to keep saying, uh, it all belongs to God, you know, uh, because we all know that. We all know that. And I said, actually, I don't think we really do. I think we know that's true, but we don't live as though it were true. And I think we better keep saying it until we start living <laughs> like it's true, and then we'll say it all the more. And, and honesty Honestly, Scripture it he doesn't just own the cattle and thousand hills. He, he he owns the earth and everything that is in it. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. You don't even belong to yourself. All we are and all we have belongs to God. So the first question we should ask when money comes in, the regular the money we get, the inheritance, a windfall, whatever it is. We should ask God, what do you want me to do with your money that you have entrusted to me? Yes. You know, the way I like to put it is with ownership and, and you have a, a very similar story, but this comes to life for me, you know, being a fiduciary, giving clients fiduciary advice in an investment company. It means that it is their money that I am managing. If I started living off their money, if I started spending all of their money instead of managing it, it would be front page news. I would be in jail. I would lose my licenses and right. I'd be the next Bernie May off right and your, and your podcast your podcast probably wouldn't go on without it would not go on my my <laughs> life would come to a stall but you know what right. that's how people live their life if we're not careful right. with god's resources we walk around as if it's all ours and we can do whatever i want and especially in america and you can't tell me that i can't spend my money the way i want and, and that that freedom that we have politically and the freedom that we have in christ doesn't mean that we should abuse that freedom no it's because of that grace that we should say no i i want to live as a steward as a fiduciary i'm going to take as little as i have to to manage these resources on behalf of god that he's endowed me with and i'm going to further the kingdom and you've talked about this a lot about buying shares into the kingdom versus buying shares here on a stock uh, uh on a company here on earth can you elaborate on that yeah, well, when Jesus said to store up treasures on, in heaven rather than on earth, and then said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Think what happens when you buy up shares of a company. Uh, let's say it's a company that you've had no interest in in the past. I mean, just to use Microsoft as an example, but it doesn't matter uh, what the company is, Apple, anything else. Um the moment you buy up shares in it, you're interested in it. Now, you, you, you could have a company that you have never cared about, but somebody advises you, yeah, buy up shares in this kingdom. And now you're reading, you hear something on the news, and it's, it's about them. You go online, you put the company in there, and you see how they're doing. Why? Because you have vested interests in wherever your money goes which is another way of saying where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So what that means is when we give to God's kingdom, when we give to uh, church planning in India, and then we hear that there's an earthquake uh, in, in the part of India where we've invested in church planning, what happens? We get on our knees and we pray. It's, now, sometimes we get on our knees and pray, even if it doesn't relate to us, it's some global tragedy. But real quickly, we move on to the next global tragedy and war and everything else. Uh, but if it's something that I've invested in, I've given in, I'm telling you, I mean, some things have happened in parts of the world where we in our ministry, we give away 100% of uh, my royalties to these different organizations, including sometimes uh, translating whole Bibles into languages of an unreached people group. Well, when I hear something from that part of the world, do you think that I'm going to forget? Do you think I'm not interested? I go, oh, no, we help those people or people nearby anyway, get the word of God in their language for the first time. Where my treasure is, there my heart is also. So if you want to have more of a heart for your church, you want to have more of a heart for God's kingdom, give more of a heart. Uh, give more uh, from the money God has entrusted you to that 
work of God, and that's where your heart is going to be. I mean, you're, you're speaking to investors and, and this is the language we talk about with, you know, clients is about investing. I mean, if you invested in Apple, like you were saying earlier, you become the biggest proponent of Apple. You're telling your friends, Hey, you don't own an iPhone. You need to switch from a Google phone to an iPhone. I mean, you start attending stockholders meetings. You pay attention to the voting. You watch the news. You talk often about the progress the company is making and you discuss the dividends and you realize, uh, and expect um, that the kingdom, sorry, the company is going to push forward for growth. And, and that's what happens if you want to, you know, be more focused on what the kingdom is doing, what the church is doing, what the Great Commission is about is give towards that and because it'll change the way you walk around. It'll change what you see. It'll change about what you talk about. It'll change what you watch and it'll change what you focus on. And so I, I think everyone needs to hear that. And, and this is in light of a time where, you know, people talk a lot about prosperity gospel, you will not give and get. If you give give and you get, you'll get more of God maybe because you'll be actually seeking the provider, seeking who is giving. And that's about the only thing that's probably a guarantee, Randy, about you know when you give is you, you'll get more of God, which is what we're after, I hope. Yeah. And another thing that I would add to that, um, that we see uh, in Acts 20, 35, where uh, the only quotation from Jesus that is not in the Gospels, but is in the book of Acts, and it is, it is more blessed to give than to receive. I've written several books on happiness, and I cannot emphasize enough how that Greek word makarios that is typically translated blessed really means happy making. It's a word for happiness or happy or happy making in, in this case. Uh, it is more blessed to give to, than to receive. It is more happy making. It will make you happier to give than to receive. And I don't know if mm. we can all probably think of examples. Hopefully we can. Something's wrong if we can't. Where we gave and we gave substantially. And the person we gave to, maybe it was a present we bought for our kids. Maybe it was a surprise uh, trip that we're sending some friends on and, you know, but whatever the, the surprise aspect of we got a gift for someone. And in the end, we say to ourselves, I think I got more joy out of that than they did. And that's exactly. true. And so, and isn't, don't we all want to be happy? And there's this thing sometimes uh, uh, in among evangelical Christians where happiness is spoken against, which is not biblically based at all. Of course, if we're sinning in the pursuit of happiness, obviously that's wrong. But there's nothing wrong with wanting to be happy. God has wired us to want to be happy. And the word joy is a synonym for uh, happiness. And it's, it's not this contrary thing that it's sometimes made out to be. But it is the words of Jesus. It is more happy making to give than to receive. So, Okay, so I give to make God happy. I give to make other people happy. And guess what? I also give with at least the result, whether it's my motive or not, of making myself more happy. Everybody wins when we give. And I guess you could say probably about the only one that loses is the devil or the demons. I mean... Amen to that. I mean, it's so true. I mean, the, I mean, last time I think I got choked up about, um, you know, a gift was not because I got socks, you know, in the package. I, I got choked up when I saw someone else receive something that they didn't think they received, should have received. And, and I think that is how we should live our life is we've received some grace that we don't deserve. So when we have any, you know, blessing of time, resources, uh, influence, we should be using that because because of what we've been already given. Um, Randy, I want to switch gears and you know a lot about this as well as I do that if 
for every time, you know, I told, you know, talked about tithing or giving, you know, people became overnight seminary students and they came out of the woodworks talking about that, you know, you, we've abolished the law and that, uh, we shouldn't be tithing. We shouldn't be giving. If anything, we should be giving crops and actual corn on the cob to our local church. So, Randy, what would you say about Old Covenant giving versus New Testament giving? Yeah, here's what I would say. I agree that we are no longer under the law. That 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 is a valid point, and we should not treat giving in a legalistic manner. However, I think it's very fair for us to say, what was God's minimum expectation of his people under the law in Old Testament times? Remember, three quarters of the Bible is the Old Testament, right? So don't throw out the three quarters of God's word. That was the the entire Bible of Jesus was the Old Testament. So don't make demeaning comments. I mean, his favorite book was Deuteronomy. I mean, Jesus quoted Deuteronomy more than anything. Exactly. So what, what we need to do is to say, all right, what has changed and what has not changed? Well, God's expectation of his people to give has not changed in the sense that he still wants us to give. And in fact, by New Testament standards, the measure is much higher and much more generous than in the Old Testament. But if you take the Old Testament There were basically three different tithes, one of which was every three years. And if you add it all up per year, it was something like 23%. But but one uh, of those tithes was more to support the nation that would be more like our taxes. But the one that would be most like what we would call 10% tithing today, uh, the way we normally think of it, uh, would be was to the temple, which was your local place of worship, and later the synagogue, which is your p- place of gathering and worship, which would be most like by far the church today. And then there are parachurch uh, ministries that are doing um, great things as well. Um, I, I, I'm head of a ministry that's one of those. I'm not against parachurch ministries, but my giving begins with the church, but it does not end with the church. And I think God calls us to give above and beyond. And I'm telling you, I have had so many conversations with people uh, who are just so down on tithing. You're just being, you're, you're, you're putting Christians in bondage by teaching them they should tithe. What I say is, uh, and I say this in a couple of my books, is that don't think of tithing as the ultimate, the high point in giving, think of it as the beginning place. So it makes sense. We go ahead and begin where God began his Old Testament people. There's nothing wrong with that, right? You don't have to say, you'll go to hell if you don't tithe, or God won't love you if you don't tithe. No, no, no. Just, just say, if he expected his Old Covenant people who didn't have the Spirit of God within them, didn't have the full revelation of God's word, were not part of the church, the dynamic local, you know, body of Christ in the world on point with mission and all this kind of stuff. Okay, they didn't have any of that. And they gave the minimum of 10% and arguably more than that. And by the way, free will offerings are all over the Old Testament. So Old Testament people under law and not under grace were constantly giving above and beyond. Wealthy people were expected to give more, not just to tithe. So now move it forward to us and say, all right, I'm not telling you all these horrible things that will happen to you if you don't tithe. I'm just asking you this question. When you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and we all will, certainly I will, we all will, who are believers, will stand before his judgment seat and give an account of our lives, what we have done with them. Uh, and he asks, uh, so you couldn't even bring yourself to give as much as I required of my poorest people in Old Testament times? I gave you far more wealth than them. And then you said, oh, no. OK, I'm not going to tithe because that's being under the law. OK, well, you didn't have to tithe. And I tell people, you don't have to tithe. Feel free to start with 15 percent or 11% 
or or twenty percent, whatever you choose. But if I were you, I wouldn't want to have to stand before the Lord and argue for why you couldn't bring yourself to give as much as God required of his Old Testament saints. I mean, it's so biblical. I mean, Jesus said, you know, thou shalt not kill. He says, no. He says, actually, if you have hate in your heart towards one another, you've, you've already committed that sin. And so we see that throughout the Bible, that grace raises the bar. So it like you always said in raises books, the bar. Exactly. That's right. And that's why I say to people, if you have a concept that law is up here and grace is down here and what people call grace giving. And honestly, I, I, I would be embarrassed to use the term. I, I, I'm not under the law. I do grace giving. And if grace giving is less than, and often it's way less than, I mean, the average evangelical Christian in America gives 2.5%. That's mm. one fourth of a tithe. And we're the richest country in human history. And, and this is like, what? How is that even conceivable? So I would just say, hey, if you've never tithed, don't do it to be a legalist. Do it to say, I want to do what God required of and blessed his old covenant people with as just a beginning point. And then I'm going to read the book of Acts and see how people were selling their land and giving uh, their, their, their assets and giving it away to the poor and following Jesus. And they, they didn't all, most people didn't sell everything. He did call a few people to do that. And he may call uh, you to do that. But if he does call you to do that, he also will provide for you and you'll go on living. It doesn't mean you'll never have financial assets again, but for sure, it's a higher level. The bar is raised for New Testament giving. And, and certainly wealthy people read uh, 1 Timothy 6, uh, command those who are rich to be rich in good deeds and be generous and willing to share. And in doing so, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. He was thinking exactly of Matthew 6. He's using the same terminology that Jesus did. Spot on. And I would love for you to share one analogy that I think really hits this home is the seatbelt analogy about the, the the difference between legalism and uh, tithing versus under grace are giving. Can you can you share with us that analogy uh, that hit home for me? Yeah. So I am, <laughs> and there there are fewer of us every year, but I am one of those people who. You know, when I was a kid, there were no seatbelts. Seatbelts were certainly not mandatory. And in, in, they were your mother's in, arm when there was an well, accident. That's right. Just let exactly. me put that out there. Mom, metal and, dashboard, and, and by the way. Years later, after seatbelts, mom would always still, if I was driving mom somewhere, she'd still put her arm out. She's, I'm driving <laughs> and she's putting her arm out for me. I said, well, so mom, we do have this, you know, shoulder harness and apparatus. But but I, I, I actually did the same thing with my kids, which is just habit. But, okay, so so I, I literally remember what it was like. I remember when we used to get in the back of pickup trucks, and you'd be with eight or ten of your friends, and dad's driving you to the lake, and, and sometimes the back, um, you know, gate was Tag down. Gate. Yeah, I mean, it's just <laughs> crazy. But anyway, so suppose now in America today, you know, uh, you were given the option. It was no longer a law. Uh it's no longer a law for people to wear seatbelts. Do you think it would be smart? Do you think it would make sense to no longer wear a seatbelt because, hey, I don't have to do it anymore? No. So many things that are law are law for your own good. They are law for your own protection. And so many Old Testament laws at least the principles and often the direct command are still in effect. I mean, is it still, does God still say, do not commit adultery? Yes. Does God still say, do not steal? Does God still say, don't covet? Does he? Yes. And then you go, well, the laws of Sabbath keeping, we're not under that law. And so that's a little different or whatever. Yeah. But there are so many Old Testament laws and one of those that laws are talked called, about in the New Testament. When, yes, you know, love, Jesus love said, one another. Said, back to the adultery question. If you look at a woman, it, again, right. grace always raises the bar. And that's what we, we must remember. Exactly. So, I mean, to me, it's like 
if if you if the law changed on seatbelts and you would still wear a seatbelt, what you're saying is sometimes I choose to do things that were under the law, not as a legalist, but because I want to do the best and safest and right thing. Yep. I want to do if it's a good idea, it's a good idea, as I've heard you right. said. Um you know, this is something that I was raised with. I'm a part of that millennial generation that was raised on Captain Planet, and we love social justice, and we want the environment to last forever, which is great. None of those things are bad. But I was training a new advisor in our in company, in our investment company, and he even said, he said, Andrew, I'm shocked how – there are profession believers that we're meeting with. They give so little yet have so much wealth and income and are still worried that they'll run out of money. Yes. And I, and I said, I said, just wait, it's not going to get any better because why do you think, I mean, is it because there's biblical illiteracy? Is it because it's easy to, uh, I talk about this in the giving crisis, that religion is easy. Religion is reasonable while Christianity is really costly. Why do you think this is the case? Well, yeah, I, I, an illustration of that would be, I, I have a friend and I, I, I've, I've said her name a few places, but I won't say her name here because uh, it's, it could be that somebody could listen to this that's in her community right. and the Bible study she leads, but she works with uh, a number of uh, extremely wealthy widows who, who, mm -hmm. who really have so much wealth, they could not begin to spend it. And every time she says she brings up giving with them, uh, then she says we hit what she has labeled to be the bag lady syndrome. She says, as soon as we start talking about giving, it's, oh, 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 yeah, but, it, it, yeah, but if I gave, I, I could end up on the street. I could end up a bag lady. I could end up. Hmm. And it's like, you are so many millions of dollars above the danger of being a bag lady that the very fact that it is coming to your mind is not just, it's just irrational. And I think, sure. I think the devil does this. He, and, and he, he, he makes us think that like we're on the verge of starvation. I mean, honestly, I look at myself. Suppose I lost everything today, which in theory I couldn't because I have things that are insured and because of this and because of that. But let's say worst case scenario, I lost everything today. I have friends. I have relatives. Now, of course, we don't want to depend on friends and relatives and all that. But all I'm saying is that None of us, uh, almost none of us, there are exceptions, almost none of us needs to worry at all about whether we're going to be going hungry. Yes, I know there's expensive things, financial care and uh, all, you know, emergency situations. There's this and there's that. And wisdom says, let's make some provision for that. But we just have over provided for ourselves. And then that wealth gets passed on to the next generation who spends it. And then they pass on money uh, to their kids as better. And I think what we need to do, and this is what I would say to people uh, it, who are in that situation, is God has entrusted this money to you. If your children are grown, um, and uh, the vast majority of people, when at least the second partner die, and even the first partner die, uh, the parent of the parents, um, their their kids are you know, out on their own, making their own living. Sometimes they're making a better living than their parents made. And they're certainly they're on track to make more money in their lifetime than their parents ever did. In almost every case, not every case. But then you have to say to yourself, Lord, you've entrusted this money to me. I'm the steward. So why am I acting as if it belongs to my children and grandchildren? By all means, be generous with your children and grandchildren and help your grandchildren in college. I'm doing that. Well, whatever. But, but what I'm saying is I'm the steward of it. God has entrusted it to me. And God has entrusted to my kids who are grown in their 40s and, you know, what he has entrusted to them. So what I've got to do then is say, Lord, not what should I do with my children's money? Because the answer to that is always just give it to them. Pass it on to them. 
But if it's not my children's money, if it's really, if I'm the steward and it's really God's money in the first place, but I'm the steward, they are not the steward of it. If I give it to them, they become the steward of it. But do we really need to be pass on excessive wealth to the next generation when in many cases it's going to become a huge temptation in their lives? It's going to motivate some of them to stop working or not work as hard, not build up their business. Um, it's going to just demotivate them. I had a, uh, a man tell I mean, it's me. it's so true. Yeah, I had a man tell me that his um, his uh, uh, man and his wife, and, and, and they were going to sit down with their three daughters and share with them that they decided to give away the vast majority of their wealth. They would leave a small amount to each of the daughters. Each of them was, you know, I mean, like uh, wealthy people already in their own lives. Uh, but the vast majority of it was going to be given to God's kingdom. And they sat down with their daughters and husbands. One daughter and husband were absolutely thrilled. They said, Mom and Dad, we're just proud of you for doing that. Can't think of a better thing that you could do with it. Nothing for you to feel about, bad about. One of them was in between. You know, I'm not so sure oh, how I feel about that. Wow, that's quite a shock. We've been counting on having this infusion of wealth far greater than they ever could have earned from their parents and unearned income is very, most often uh, is a great danger. And then there was the third couple that were angry. Uh, and it was like, how dare you? I mean, Oh, I know. I mean, there's a famous uh, passage in the, the book millionaire mind that, you know, I read it when I was 15 and before I was given financial advice, I was like, I can't believe this is the attitude in the book, the millionaire mind, the, the, you know, parent sits them down and one child stands up and says, you can't give away our money. Oh, <laughs> and that's the exact attitude that you're, you're describing that if we're not careful, our children will start to expect that. Of course, you're going to leave the inheritance to me, which if we go back full circle to my duty as a fiduciary to clients, imagine if I was managing someone's money and I left their money to my children, right? If it's truly exactly. all gods, then I'm just a pass through and I am only taking what I need to live on to have a really reasonable life. And the rest is passing through to what God's will is for his kingdom to help the least of these, the orphan, the foreigner, the sojourner. And so I, I really also liked that you talked about the bag lady syndrome, because I've talked to so many people that have again, immense wealth that they'll never spend. And I've right. literally gone to almost grabbing their shoulders and shaking them saying, you're not going to run out of money. You can spend more right. money in retirement. Not only can you spend more money in retirement, you can give more give money in more. retirement. And I tell them, I say, it, at the end of the day, I mean, calling it, you know, calling it what it is, it can be a lack of faith. God said that he will take care of the sparrows. So if you lost all of this, he's still going to take care of you. I mean, if it, like the movie Jim Bailey, like you talked about, we have network, you know, these safety nets from the government. We have networks of friends and family that would take care of us, but that's so unrealistic and probably is not going to happen. And so that's why I would like everyone listening to take a stewardship pledge that, you you know, I plan on tithing 10% of my entire estate and I put that in my legal documents. I put that in my trust and my will to give at least 10% of my net worth away. And I doubt your kids would even miss it when you do. Right. And I would say, uh, given the amount that's been entrusted to us, I think some people should be giving 90% or more mm. of their wealth away. Love it. Um, certainly the majority of wealth that I will leave behind will go to God's kingdom. It's designated there. And the, uh, the, the, the royalties from the books will continue to go into kingdom work. And, and most of my retirement funds will do that. And, and then uh, what, what I'll leave for my kids is, is probably the value of this house I'm talking about, which split between two families will be a significant amount of money. But not so significant that it can totally demotivate them. Oh, well, let's let's retire 15 years early and let's not, um, you know, let's spend the rest of Contribute our Contribute to society. <laughs> yeah, let's buy, um, a, you know, a, a second or a third home somewhere. No, we don't, don't even 
do that. We're held accountable for what God has entrusted to us. Don't just pass that on to your children for them to be held accountable for it, along with what they're already held accountable for. You give generously and be an example to your children. Be an example to your church. And uh, don't, don't leave money that tempts them. Leave enough money to help them, but not to change their lifestyles and their way of thinking, which most often is harmful. You, you look at the studies of lottery winners and the catastrophic things that happen in those families. It's, it's just shocking. Well, that's so true. I, I think uh, Jim Rohn, I'll give him the credit for this. He said, uh, many times people say, if I just had a million dollars, I would never work another day in my life. And he says, maybe the good Lord's seeing to it that you don't right. because you need that's to exactly add to society. Right. <laughs> exactly right. And uh, how many parents who love their kids and therefore think, well, it, I mean, you, it's, it's like that bumper sticker that says, I'm spending my kids' inheritance. Well, even though it's a joke, it, it is at the same time, You're saying it's their inheritance? It belongs to them? No, it doesn't belong. You choose what their inheritance will be. And whether that will be 100% of what you leave behind, which I don't think normally is wise, or if it will be 10% of what you leave behind or whatever the figure is, um, that is your money to manage. And God has entrusted them with funds that they need to manage and they need to have a work ethic in their lives. Absolutely. Um, I, I'll leave you with one more question is how do we eternally secure our wealth? Yeah, I think it's by doing exactly what Jesus says to store up for yourselves treasures in heaven and not on earth. Uh, and exactly what it says in, in first Timothy six as well, uh, in terms of being generous and quick to give ready to share storing up for yourselves Treasures is a firm foundation for the coming age. That's talking about eternal reward. Make your foundation for eternity. And it's like that's a firm foundation. That's a building term, right? So we all know that the foundation is basic to the building of a house. If the foundation is faulty, the house crumbles. Um, And uh, this is what we need to do is to think in terms of eternity, give in terms of eternity, one for the immediate good of the needy people who surround us. And that's not just people, that is people in poverty, but it's also people in gospel poverty and in scripture poverty. They don't, they haven't had the gospel and they don't have the scriptures in their own language. Let's give to that for God's glory, for their good. And at the same time, it's for our good. And you live like that. You're living with an eternal perspective. I love it. You know, either your assets will leave you or you will leave your assets. I know you've said something very similar. I mean, the return of Christ makes all currency devalued 100%. I mean, if uh, Christ comes back tomorrow, your investments are devalued. And so I talk on a regular basis about risky investments and guaranteed investments. But A.W. Tozer said it best. It is one of the glories of the Christian religion that faith and love can transmute lower values into higher values. Earthly possessions can be turned into heavenly treasures. Yes, you know, Randy, transmutation of wealth. I love that. Exactly. And I, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show, but I want other people to know where they can find more information about all the books that you've written and uh, where will you be over the next few months? Where can people find you? Yeah, go to epm.org. Eternal Perspective Ministries is what EPM stands for. Um, and go to epm.org and you'll see all my books. You'll see an incredible number. And I, I sometimes am shocked at how much we've got on the website that I've written that's never been published in a book or wow. that blogs that are based on things that I put uh, in books and other members of our staff and questions and answers. And it's just uh, a page where somebody say, man, I came across your website it's a gold mine, and I'm going. I don't. I, I never thought of that. We just kept adding to it, and that's that's one of the benefits of getting old. I'm 69 now, and so you just keep going. And so I've now written over 60 books, and people wow. say, "Wow, over 60 books." I say the key is start young and then get old. So this is where. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I thank you for getting old and sharing your wisdom with all of yeah. us because you're inspiring generations of, of people like me that want to share about the joys of giving and not missing out on the joy of giving. And so I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. Uh, you're welcome, Andrew. Great to be with you and God bless you and what you're doing. Thank you. Well, that's all we have for this episode of the Rich, Young, and Powerful podcast. One thing that would really help us both and other new potential listeners is for you to rate our show on iTunes and Spotify. Also, check out our YouTube channel at The Everyday Philanthropist to get your answers to questions on tithing, philanthropy, and giving. And also, be sure to check out my book, The Giving Crisis, which you can pick up on Amazon or click the link below. But until next time, remember that when a giver gives more, they receive and become more. <music> 